this week, November 1st through 8th, is Drowsy Driving Prevention Week. It's a good time to remember that drowsy driving is impaired driving. According to the National Sleep Foundation, about half of US adult drivers admit to getting behind the wheel drowsy. I would like to take a minute to thank the California Office of Traffic Safety for providing a grant for us to bring these programs to you through the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration. We really appreciate their support. So in honor of this week, we are gonna have a conversation with Caleb Trahan. In 2017, Caleb suffered a very serious crash and unfortunately it was due to drowsy driving. And I really wanna give my respect and props to Caleb for sharing his story in the hopes that he can convince you not to make the same decision. Caleb, thank you for joining us today. Thank you, I'm glad to be here. Great, great. It's good to finally kind of meet you. We had a long phone conversation before, but now we actually get to, to virtually meet each other. So thanks for being here. Uh, yeah, so I wanted to um, have you tell the story to our viewers about your crash, because when you told me, it kind of blew my mind. Um, there was so much to it, and the, uh, the ramifications have been so straight, you know, serious for you that I, um, I want you to tell our viewers about it. Absolutely. So it was the weekend of Mother's Day of 2017. Um, I just got off work Friday and went out with some friends and then Saturday I woke up really early that morning. Uh, I maybe had about an hour and a half, two hours of sleep. And I worked all day Saturday and uh, I had, we had family in town. It was a big old weekend. My sister was graduating from University of Houston. So just a big weekend. That night, a buddy of mine called me to go help him fix his truck about an hour away. So we went out there, we got all that done. It's about midnight. And uh, he's like, hey, I'm gonna go buy you a drink. You know, I wanna buy you a beer. And I'm like, man, I'm tired. I, I have not slept. Yeah. Well, he twisted my arm, so we stopped into a bar. He buys me a drink. I gave him back the second one. I'm like, man, I'm, I'm exhausted. I'm, I need to go to bed. And about seven miles down the road, I fell asleep. And my vehicle left the road and I hit a very big pole. Uh, and that's what started the wreck. Okay. Um, you know, I don't remember anything from then on, essentially. Yeah. So there was no other um, vehicle involved in your crash, right? Fortunately not. Uh, and it could have been really bad if there was. Yeah. And did, did your mom have any words of wisdom for you before you decided to go help your friend with his truck that day? She did. Uh, she, with hesitation, because I was 25, she looked at me and she says, you look tired. Are you sure you're good to go? Should you be going out? I'm like, mom, I'm good. I do this all the time. Like, it's exactly what I said. And looking back at it now, it's just, it's crazy. Yeah. But I'm like, mom, I, I got this. Yeah. So what, I didn't have it. <laughs> yeah, I know. Mother knows best, yeah. right? One of those reminders. Uh, Times. So what happened? Okay, so you crashed. You don't remember the crash. What do you remember next? So I remember waking up in the hospital. Um, so the crash happened really early Sunday morning, and I woke up Thursday in the hospital. And <clears throat> I just I kept asking the same three questions. You know, I asked where I was. And my mom said, you're in the hospital. I'm like, you know, what happened? She said, you ran a really bad car wreck last weekend. Yeah. And then I just, I got scared. And the next thing I asked her was, did I hurt anybody else? Oh. And she said, no, just you. And, um, you know, I asked that for probably a good day or two. Really? Over and over again. Right. Yeah. And, uh, during this time, you know, I, I've kind of found out more along about the story, the wreck, and I really learned about it for the next month or two to follow as well on just different things that happen. Okay. So um, if I remember correctly, there was a, a doctor or a nurse that happened upon the crash scene, right? Yeah. So I found that out 
about two weeks into the hospital, the paramedics came to visit me. And uh, they were telling me the story from, you know, what they had to do and all this and that they were like climbing onto my truck to, cause I was hanging out, I was in the windshield laying on the engine. So how she told me how they were having to, to work this, this wreck, one of the you know, worst wrecks that they've, they've really seen. And uh, they told me about this emergency room doctor who is the one that was talking to the 911 dispatcher. Okay. And she was there, she was holding my hand, she was you know, trying to keep me awake. And when they got there, she told them everything that she knew. And then she kind of stepped back and let them work. So when I got out of the hospital, I found her on Facebook, um, sent her a message. And I'll say, hey, I don't know if you know who I am or remember me. She did. Yeah. And uh, yeah. I told him, like, you know, thank you so much. And as I met her, I got to find out, I found out a lot more about what she was doing. And just, it put it all together. Really? Um, yeah. So when she told me, she like, I was, I was holding your hand. She's like, I was yelling at you. Um, trying to keep you awake. I used my mom voice. Her uh, quote, I use my mom voice. Yeah. She told me it's Mother's Day morning. You're not going to die right now. Yeah. And she did everything that she could to keep me awake. Wow. And she, um, she did she think you weren't going to make it based on your injuries? Absolutely. So she went home and she was crying. She, she told her husband, he's a firefighter paramedic as well, and she told him, and he's told her, you know how that goes, you have to let it go. And she said, I know, but I can't. I mean, he was talking to me, and then he stopped. And it was Mother's Day morning, you know, so she's, she's worried about my mom, you know, just a random stranger. And she's like, you know, there's no way that you live or survive that. Right. So do you stay in touch with the doctor? Have you guys connected at all lately or...? I do. Actually, I just texted her, I think last week, um, I was at work and there was a car accident in that same exact intersection. Really? Yeah. So right there. So I sent her a picture of it and I said, guess where I'm at? Oh no. Wow. Yeah. Everything come out of that wreck okay? That crash? Yes. Good. Yes. They were, they were just fine. Okay. Good. Good. So can you tell uh, our teens that are watching a little bit about the injuries that you suffered? Yeah, absolutely. So again, I was basically, I was partially ejected. I was standing up and out of the windshield. Um, I broke pretty much everything except for my hips. I broke everything in my face, my neck, my both shoulders, my, my the clavicles, my sternum, all of the ribs on my left, and I think four on my right. Um, both of my lungs collapsed. I had a third degree burn on my chest from the engine block. Uh, my left leg was broken half. Um, my right leg was crushed. My right ankle was crushed. Um, you know, 55, I think, total injuries. I bled out completely. I, um, I, know I'm talking to you now. I mean, you're just, I can't even. That is amazing, tragic. Uh, I don't even know what to say. I'm speechless with all those injuries. It was, it was bad. It hurt. <laughs> Yeah. And what's it like to recover from something like that? I mean, after you got out of the hospital, was life just back to normal for you? Or did you have, you know, do you have further consequences from not just being hospitalized, but rehab and, and all of that? Absolutely. So when I was in the hospital for a little over a month, almost a month and a half. And when I got home, I was, I was stuck in bed. I couldn't move. I was non-weight bearing on both of my legs and my left, yeah, my left arm. And um, so I'm just, I was stuck in bed and that in itself was torturous and an emotional state. Um, so, you know, I'm laying in bed. I just survived this unsurvivable wreck. Right. And yeah. honestly, I, I wanted to die. Um, I kept wishing, I, I wish I would have just died in the wreck and not being stuck here. And uh, I, I remember thinking, trying to figure out a way to actually kill myself. 
and not have it hurt my parents like I just did. And, you know, there was no way that I could do that. There was this kind of like, you know, this is, this is where I'm at right now. Right. Right. And when I reached out to the ER doctor, um, she told me, she's like, you know, you don't walk away from something like that. And she said, don't take that for granted. Right. So that kind of just started sticking with me and I was trying to figure out how to do this and what to do next. And at that point I quit taking my pain meds and I just, I stood up. This was about beginning of July. So I've been out of the hospital for a couple of weeks and I just, I stood up, I fell. <laughs> that really hurt. Yeah. Yeah, I just, I kept going and I kept, I taught myself how to walk because I refused to just lay there. And my doctors weren't very happy about it, but I kind of, I just, I had to do what I had to do. I had to keep going. Yeah. Sounds like you were saving your own life through this process, going Thanks. from suicidal to a thriver which is what you seem to be now at the thriver stage where we, you go from the crash victim to the, to the survivor to thriver and you forced yourself there with your, with your um, outlook and, and attitude of not giving up. Yeah. I mean, I, I guess I don't look at it like that. I just, I couldn't sit still. I, I had to do something and uh, I get, you know, so after, uh, during this time, I'm trying to figure out how to help. My uncle, he told me when I was in the hospital, he said, it's time to create a success story. Mm -hmm. So exactly, I'm in this place that I don't want to be in. And, you know, I've ruined everyone around me. I've ruined their lives. My parents, my family, you know, I tell everyone they always had it harder than I did. And, you know, they did. My, my mom got that phone call Mother's Day morning yeah. and she yeah. thought I was going to be dead when I got to the hospital. Yeah. So I just I've ruined so much around me. It's like how do I how do I make it better? So you know, it's about this time I'm I'm walking around. I was kind of mobile, and uh, I found an EMT school to go to, so I could hopefully try to help someone else. Uh, I think the big reason for me was I can't thank the people who saved me, and I can't I can't repay them. So hopefully I could do something bigger and better and they could get the appreciation of that. Yeah. I think that was my initial goal. So I became an EMT wow. and uh, found that I really love it. Yeah. Now, don't you, do, do I remember you saying that you work with some of the people that were at your crash or was it just that you had connected with them? Um, so I actually got hired on to the same service that responded to my wreck. So I've gotten to work with most of the people on the, on the ambulance that were working on me. And I don't know, I don't know how it feels for them, but it's, it's pretty cool for me. Yeah, I bet. I bet. Well, I, I can only guess that they feel so validated in their career choice to see a story like yours, because so many don't have great endings that, to see you, you know, is just an inspiration and to hear your story is so inspiring. So how, yeah, it's that. yeah. Go ahead. How's the, like, are there long-term traumatic effects for your family or like, is your mom like more um, protective now? Does, you know, does that last longer than the crash, that trauma and fear? It definitely does. Yeah, definitely. It's a lot better than I guess it, it could have been because I'm okay. But I remember when I first started to drive after the wreck, my mom was, she wasn't having it. She couldn't sleep. Uh, if, I mean, she did not like it. Yeah. Um, even now, if I work a long shift, I mean, my mom is big on don't drive. They, it's changed them. You know, they don't, drink and drive at all. I think they've Ubered more in the last couple of years than they've ever used a taxi. Good. Just because it's not worth the risk. I think we all learned that that one split decision, it changes everything. And right. you, kinda, you can't control it from there. No, no, you can't. And one of the things that we try and impress upon teens and adults that, that, um, that we work with is that when you make the decision to get behind the wheel, whether it be 
alcohol impaired or drowsy driving, um, you're making a decision for a lot more people than just yourself. You're making a decision for all of the people on the road around you and for the people who love you because of what you're describing right now, the, the long-term effects on those who love you. So, wow, I just, I'm so happy that you reached out to SAD and that I've been able to talk with you now twice and meet you virtually. Uh, I just, you inspire me when, when you work in this field, there are a lot of stories that don't have the outcome that yours does or um, people have their stories, but they don't share them to empower others and to empower good choices. Um, and, you know, this is um, dry, uh, Drowsy Driving Prevention Week, but your story resonates 365, you know, because do you feel like the alcohol may have exacerbated your exhaustion? I'm sure it did. Um, you know, I definitely didn't drink enough to be drunk, yeah. but uh, I don't think it helped the state that I was in. And that's probably what pushed me over the edge. Right. Okay. All right. Well, Caleb, you know, I, I don't know um, if you have a website that you want people to, to come to and, and learn more about your story or follow you on social media or not. But if you do, you're welcome to, to shout it out right now so that they can keep, uh, keep track of you and your story. I don't, I wish I did. I want to, I want to work on all this. And, yeah. But no, I don't right now. When you get that done, let us know and we'll be happy to share it with our followers because I know they're going to want to stay in touch with your story. And with okay, you. absolutely. So how are you doing right now? How, how are you doing physically? Um, pretty good. It's starting to get cold outside. So it's cold in the mornings and then it warms up. Yeah. And I feel it. Um, I'd say I'm. I'd say uncomfortable. Yeah. Uh, I had a surgery, at the beginning of this year, on my leg. So my leg was crushed, and they I lost blood flow for about six seven hours. So they have to keep going in every every so often and do maintenance on it. If not, I might lose my leg. Okay. So yeah, definitely want to follow up. And how are you doing emotionally? Does this, does speaking about it and knowing that you're changing lives and saving lives through your story, um, does that help your emotional well-being at all? Knowing that you're turning something very tragic into something that can be life-saving? It does. Um, I started speaking at high schools and I had a mom tell me, it was my first speech, and she, and she told me that, um, she said, you need to do this full time. She said, uh, you just touched 6,000 people and you impacted 6,000 kids yeah. in 25 mm -hmm. minutes. She's like, that's more people than you can ever fit in the back of your ambulance and you're, you're talking to them before it happens. Right. And when she told me that, I'm like, oh my, I kind of want to do this now. Yeah. And I love talking to kids and, you know, hanging out with them after, after my speech. And Great. So I, I absolutely love this. If I could do this full time and just travel the United States and talk to kids, I would do it. Absolutely. Good. Well, I hope that once, you know, the country opens up again, once we have, um, you know, the opportunities to, to do at conferences in person and, and school events, I, I know that we're going to keep in touch with you and you're at the top of the list. Uh, I know that your influence is really strong and um, we're all, you know, we're all going to want to stay in touch with you and see how you're doing. Awesome. That'd be great. That'd be great. All right. Thank you so much for being here. And one of the ways that you can follow Caleb right now is to follow uh, California SAD or the SAD Nation on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook. So check us out, stay with us, follow us. And until Caleb's got his own platforms, um, we'll give updates on what Caleb's doing. All right. Thanks everybody for being here. Caleb, thank you so much for sharing your story and for being a change maker. Um, I'm just so glad you're here and I, I feel really privileged to know you now. So thank you. Thank you for having me. I, that means a lot coming from you. Oh, thank you. Okay, well, I'm gonna let you get back to your day and uh, I'll be in touch really soon. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Lynn. All right, thank you. Bye everyone.